Well, it's great to be able to have a bit of time this afternoon with you, Claire. Claire this is Claire Clark, who is a vicar in West London. But Claire, would you tell us a little bit about yourself and the context that you're in and how long you've been there? Yes, so I'm Claire Clark. I have been here in Hounslow West, which is right next to Heathrow Airport, if you don't know where it is. And uh, I've been here for five and a half years. Before that, I worked for two churches, one in East Twickenham and one in Sunbury. So similar kind of area, West London. Uh, and I was at 11 years in each of those um, churches and been here for five and a half years. And we are here in Hounslow in a really diverse, multicultural area uh, with quite a lot of deprivation. So in our borough, we our area is the highest deprivation. So we have 41.7% of people living in poverty here. And so um, we also have a high percentage of people from Asia, um, but also from pretty much every nation of the world. Um, there's 187 languages uh, spoken in our borough. And um, just through our, our work as a church, we've translated quite a lot of our church stuff into, at the moment, 27 languages. So that just gives you an wow. idea of the kind of um, context that I'm, I'm in, yeah. Fantastic. And full disclosure, I think we ought to say up front here that you're my sister. So it's a particular yes, joy to be able to have some time with you. Um, but we're spending a little bit of time in our uh, in a, our session at Wycliffe this week, thinking about leading in mission. And, um, you know, so we, we've been exploring the, the five marks of mission. And obviously, by the sounds of it, you know, all of those are going to come into play and going to be important tools for you to spread the gospel in Hounslow West. Um, but could you tell us, we're, we're, we're looking specifically, I suppose, at evangelism. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about how you have seen evangelism in your context change over the time that you've been there. Yes, so COVID has had a huge impact on our evangelism. Mm. I don't know if this is across the nation, but particularly here, we've been hit really hard, both by COVID and the cost of living crisis. And our proximity to Heathrow Airport, the amount of people doing zero hours co uh, contracts and that kind of thing. And what we have found is pre-COVID, um, we tried to do all our evangelism and mission for our community. And during COVID pandemic, we have been doing more and more and more with our community. So we have... Um, two food banks now we had one and then during covid we set up a second food bank because the need was just so great and suddenly we had so much work to do and um it was so time consuming and so um important and we were really able to meet so many people and serve them um and then talk to them about jesus mm. that we were didn't have the capacity really uh, to do what we were trying to do and loads of people from the community started saying, oh, can we help? How can we help? And we were like, oh, you're not a Christian. And, um, you know, we want to be keep Jesus at the centre of everything we're doing, all our mission and ministry. Um, and then suddenly the door kind of really flung wide open. And we had community people come in every week to help us sort the shelves and sort out food and things like that and give and donate. And as we started to partner with people in our community who didn't know Jesus, they asked us loads of questions about Jesus. They were like, why are you doing this? What's going on here? Um, they caught something of, um, they caught something of the DNA of us as a church and what was firing us up. Mm -hmm. And um, we run our food banks out of our two church locations. So I'm a vicar with two church buildings and um, having non so many non-Christians come in all sorts of partner organisations come in, schools come in uh, to our church buildings to help us with acts of service, which is part of our mission and evangelism, led to a whole lot of fruit and conversations, which we really weren't expecting. And it's just given us opportunities through our service to open up conversations. We have a large um, number of asylum seekers and refugees. And... Obviously, there's all the politics surrounding that, but having them come right here on our doorstep and we run a weekly um, 
It's called Hope Haven. And we gathered together all asylum seekers and refugees from all sorts of countries. And I'd say 90% of them have been through trauma. Mm. And probably what we're seeing is 60% of them are coming from maybe Muslim backgrounds, uh, other faith backgrounds. And they are so open to the gospel because of what they've been through because of the fact that they can't even ask questions about other faiths in their countries Mm. um there's a real sense of please tell us and almost on a weekly basis we have new refugees and asylum seekers coming in saying basically can you tell us about Jesus so we're running Farsi Alpha at the moment as well as Alpha in English and we're looking at ways to um really share our faith with them and again we we were starting off how can we just tell them about Jesus how can we tell them about Jesus but they want to serve they want some purpose they're stuck in hotel rooms they can't get out they've some of them with their families there's nothing to do they're not allowed to work they've got no purpose lots of them we've had um young men who are suicidal from Iran we've had um people just weeping and weeping people who have been in this country for up to six months and still haven't been able to let their families know that they are safe Mm -hmm. and just saying can we pray to Jesus for you and and giving them things to do so they help with that we have a garden so we do gardening we grow crops for our food bank and they've come and they've been digging the garden they've um they're, they're doing some cleaning for us as a church. And you'd think, oh, no, but they really want to find purpose. Mm. And this sharing of how can we share Jesus with you? How can we serve you and support you? How can you give back and bring up purpose to us as a community has been a real key in our evangelism, which I don't think five, six years ago was in the thinking of us as a church. Gosh, that's really extraordinary. So it's almost as though by kind of uh, being involved in those other marks of mission, that's that's been like a springboard and giving you access to be able to do the proclamation one and to be able to kind of uh, speak about Jesus. That That's really uh, an incredible story to hear. And um, ha- this is slightly off piece, but I'm just interested in how equipped you feel in that or felt in that, because I suppose it's not, uh, you know, it, it's a really unique context that you're in. And you probably didn't have like loads of training around this when you were, training to a vicar and stuff has it been a bit of a learning journey for you indeed yes it's been a huge (laughs) learning curve um but we've partnered all the way along so um here in the london diocese there is a vicar whose um remit is to reach farsi speaking um community so he comes and he runs our farsi alpha we um um link again with the diocese they have compassionate communities and they're looking at all all areas of compassion and mission through compassion and so they've helped us in terms of uh, training fundraising resources um so yes we definitely couldn't do it on our own but we have the most incredible um group uh, a team of church members as well who are coming alongside and working um all throughout the week Um, The other huge area of evangelism has been in our uh, young people. So we currently um, have, I think it's something like 130 people on our football team uh, register. (laughs) And we're seeing about 80 people come each week for football. I've heard of five aside, but 80 aside, that's that's a logistics requirement. um, This is an area of our mission and evangelism which for the first two years of me being in this context, we kept on saying, oh, should we stop it now? Should we stop it now? It's so hard work. It's not very fruitful. Are we doing the right thing? And uh, every time we had that conversation, let's just do one more term, literally (laughs) for like two or three years. Let's just do one more term. And um, now it has expanded loaded and we have people from all religious backgrounds uh, again lots of muslims he seeks hindus um catholics some um church of england people some you know some no faith at all and um we are really intentional about who we are um we are hope football academy and they all have their own you know outfits and everything and um it's been the most incredible opportunity so each session we're like a values-based um football club so we'll talk about a value 
and we partner with Kick UK, Kick Football, and um, they uh, have sent trainers and missioners, and they come in and talk about Jesus to our young people. And again, five, ten years ago, I'd have thought they're just gonna no way they're gonna say back away. What are you doing? And instead, there's like, they all come, we have people in their full hijabs and, you know, asking questions and coming along to our youth events. And we started again, um, all our big festivals, we now ask our kick families to serve at. And it sounds odd, but they all come at Christmas, we had um, two or 300 people come and um, we gave away things to our food bank families. So gifts, toys for under 11s, um, some food, things like that, some treats. And our our kick families, our football families, mostly who do not know Jesus, came and they did a barbecue for everybody. And when they were there, we told everybody about Jesus. We celebrated Christmas. And again, I thought this shouldn't work. Mm -hmm. But somehow they're so open. And just um, last week, we had two young people from that group give their lives to Christ. And it, it just blows my mind. How is this going on? Um, and I guess finally on that, um, the our work with the council. So when I first arrived here, I set up a meeting with um, the council and they brought people from about nine different departments of the council. And I talked about our hearts, what we wanted to do, how we wanted to serve our community. And I was really, really bold. And I said, you know, our motivation is Jesus. We want to show people the love of Jesus. So that's what we're about. And I, and I recognise your motivation is different as a council. But a lot of the things we're wanting the same, we want to help people in some of the same ways. So I'm happy for us to work together. But I also totally understand if you don't want to partner with a faith-based organisation. And um, again, totally beyond what I expected. They were like, come on then. Yeah, we can do this together. We don't mind that you, um, your motivation is Jesus. That's fine. That's not our motivation. But And so we started doing all this stuff together. And every single time, um, like at the beginning of a session, um, we had about five council people and then about 12 of us from the church to run a session, whether it's food bank or debt help or back to work or whatever. And we say to everybody, right, we're going to pray now. And we, all the council guys, we say, you know, come and join us if you want to pray. If you don't, that's absolutely fine. And we go for it in prayer. And again, I just think in the past, people would have walked out, thought, what, you're a lunatic or what is this all about? Uh, but half of the people from the council actually join us for prayer. Right. And we're asking for the Holy Spirit to work. And we're asking for opportunities to share the love of Jesus. And they're like with us. And the other half sit on the side be it they're quiet they really respect it even though they've no idea and that has led to um a funny kind of evangelism in that the council are our biggest promoters mm -hmm. in our area yeah. so when somebody's in need and they go to the council about so many different things the council will say have you heard about hope church hounslow why don't you pop down there they'd be able to help you and again, I never would have seen that in mission and evangelism as a strategy. <laughs> um, but and I don't even know oh. if it is a strategy, but it seems to be something where we've known the favour of the Lord during this yeah. season. That is that's so exciting. I, I think it's just so wise to just to be kind of bold and upfront about who you are and where, what you're there for, because then yeah. you're naming the elephant in the room, aren't you? And you can just kind of get beyond that then. And, you know, it, it's every, everything's clear. Oh, that's yeah. brilliant. So um, just a final question for you, really, about um, how how do you seek to encourage your whole congregation to keep a missional focus? Um, we are in a situation of being a church plant. So um, the, the church was closed for two years back 2010 to 2012. And during that time, a mosque actually tried to buy the church. And um, that's when the Church of England said, come on, let's plant. So a team came in. So we don't have, this is how it was done 30, 40, 60 yeah. years ago. Uh, and mission has been at the heart from the beginning. So mission and service are in the DNA. Yeah. Um, so from that point of view, I know I have it a lot easier 
than some other people in their context. Uh, and we've just been really intentional about keeping it at the forefront. Um, there's a lot of um, change here. It's fast moving. Um, things like the asylum seekers and refugees will work with the group for six months and then they'll all be moved and we'll have another group. And um, so it's a very fast moving context. And so to keep mission right at the forefront, and to tell stories. So we're always telling stories. You know, yeah. Last year, we as a church, we fed 11,087 people. Wow, we did that as a church. And everybody thinks, yeah. And then, you know, we're the largest kick academy. And how exciting is that? We were going <laughs> to close it so many times, weren't we? And now look <laughs> what God is doing through that. So I guess storytelling is a huge way. So we try to celebrate often what God is doing. Mm -hmm. um, and testimony from people who've come to Christ. Um, and we have a, a little checklist. So every single time we talk about um, what's coming up, what we want to do new, um, we're like, is it Jesus centered? So we don't want to be in social services. We don't want to be in mission childcare. We want to do Jesus focused, Jesus centered ministry. And then um, how will this be taken by our community? So um, things like putting stuff into different languages. Um, we've got coming up our Ugandan takeover service. And then we've got our Asia takeover service when all the people from that area, they take the service, they wear their dress. So we kind of celebrate who we are in our context and how we do mission that will look very different in another context. Yeah. But um I think that helps keep the energy, the vision, the vitality of people wanting to be involved in mission. Oh, that is just so exciting. I, I know I said that's a final question, but I, there's just one more thing that I'd love to ask you about. Um, it just sounds so extraordinary what God's doing there. And it's just really brilliant to be able to share that with everyone today. Um, but I just wondered, have, have there been, have you, have you come across opposition? Has there been opposition or challenge along the way? Because, oft, you know, obviously Jesus promised us that when we go go out with the gospel, that there would be opposition. So I just wondered if you've encountered anything yes. like that. Yes, we have had opposition. We've had um, doors closed in some of our schools work. So we've got five primary schools in our parish. And because it's so multicultural, like three of them, basically banned us they won't have us ever coming in um which is really sad I know that we haven't so they definitely put their nope we don't want you um I personally I when I first got here I had two Muslim Muslim men spit at me as I walked down the street with my dog collar and I think it from what I now understand it it's partly that I was a woman wearing a dog collar it's probable what um some of my Muslim friends think that's probably what was happening then. Um, so some quite in your face um, opposition. Um, the, the need in our area is so great. And we could definitely, we can't do it all. Mm. And um, it feels like, um, I don't know if it's spiritual opposition or some discipleship stuff but you know sometimes just being able to resource mm -hmm. and to um have the wisdom to really discern what god is calling us to and mm -hmm. what he isn't which i'm not great at because i want to say yes to everything yeah. um so um but sometimes that's felt like doors are closing or uh things are shutting down because of opposition um on the whole i think in our area, uh, there's a much more acceptance of religious faith. And mm. where we are, the majority of people do have some kind of religious faith. Yeah. And so actually, less opposition on that front than, say, 20 years ago in ministry, when you felt like you had to have an argument for everything and you had to um, be able to argue a case for faith. Um, there's much more openness, I think, mm. now. And on the whole, respect for faith mm -hmm. um, and in the way that we try to share our faith, because it's through service, that's 
that is our vehicle for sharing our faith. We try to serve and share, serve and share, serve and share. So, um, yeah, some opposition and some really hard seasons and times where we want to give up. Um, but also, I really believe that this is a season like no other, and particularly with the asylum seekers and refugees. Uh, they are coming to Christ in our nation right now, mm -hmm. and many of them are going back to nations across the world where they'd never be able to hear about Christ, wow. and they are spreading the news. We've got these things called navigators, so we wow. give everybody um, the Bible, which looks like a little plastic box, um, and it's got the spoken words. Nobody would know it was a Bible, so they could take it back into their countries and even in the hostels here there's quite a lot of um well there is a, a lot of persecution for muslims becoming christians and um, a lot of people who come to us who their families yeah. have completely disowned them and so being you know working that through working out how to support and walk with and make it safe uh, as much as you can um that's definitely been a big challenge Wow, Claire, thank you so much for your time. Just so inspiring to hear about everything that's going on there. Um, so grateful. And I, you know, I feel inspired to pray for you afresh, having heard that those stories, and I'm sure that others here will as well. Um, so thank you and uh, bless you as you go. Thank you. Take care. God bless. Bye. Bye.